Hi, Stu Schwartz from MasterMathMentor.com. This is video BC09. The topic is Calculus and Parametric Equations, and it covers the BC manuals, pages 44 through 46. Suppose we have a smooth curve, C, given by the parametric equations x equals f of t and y equals g of t. Then the slope of C is given by dy dx equals dy dt over dx dt if dx dt is not zero. This seems like a simple enough formula, but this formula is in terms of t, not x. So to find the slope of the tangent line to a parametric equation at some point x, y, we need to find the corresponding value of t when the curve goes through the point x, y. We will also find that the curve will have a horizontal slope if dy dt equals 0, but dx dt does not equal 0. The curve will have a vertical slope if dx dt equals 0, and dy dt is not equal to 0. If both dy dt equals 0 and dx dt equals 0 at the same time, our results are inconclusive. You are given the parametric equations x is equal to cosine t, y equals negative sine t, and you're asked to find dy dx at three locations. First, t equals pi over 3, b at the point 1, 0, and c at the point 0, negative 1. There are two ways to handle this. One, using rectangular equations, function mode, or secondly, dealing with parametric equations. We will do both. To deal with this problem in terms of rectangular equations, which is function mode, we must first eliminate the parameter. We square both variables, x squared equals cosine squared t and y squared equals sine squared t. And since sine squared t plus cosine squared t equals 1, then x squared plus y squared is equal to 1. Now we can take the derivative of of the equation implicitly. And we get 2x plus 2y dy dx equals 0, and dy dx is equal to negative x over y. To find dy dx at t equals pi over 3, we must find the point xy, because dy dx is equal to negative x over y. We use the fact that x is equal to cosine of pi over 3, which is 1 half, and y is equal to negative sine of pi over 3, which is negative square root of 3 over 2. So dy dx is equal to negative 1 half over negative square root of 3 over 2, which is square root of 3 over 3. b is the point 1, 0, and dy dx is equal to 1 over 0, which does not exist. C is the point 0, negative 1, and dy dx is equal to 0 over negative 1, which is 0. The graph of x squared plus y squared equals 1 is a circle of radius 1. But the plane curve to the parametric equation, x equals cosine t, y equals negative sine t, is a circle of radius 1 with a clockwise orientation. We see the point t equals pi over 3, and indeed, the tangent line has a positive slope. At the point 1, 0, the tangent line is vertical, and therefore it has a slope which is undefined. At the point 0, negative 1, the tangent line is horizontal and has a slope of 0. Let's work the problem parametrically. To find dy dx at t equals pi over 3, we use our equation that dy dx is equal to dy dt over dx dt, which is negative cosine t over negative sine t, which is cotangent of t. So dy dx at t is equal to pi over 3 
is the cotangent of pi over 3, which is 1 over the tangent of pi over 3, and that is square root of 3 over 3. In part b, we are given the point 1, 0, and that leaves us with the reverse of the problem that we had above. We have a point in terms of x and y, but our dy dx formula is in terms of t. So we use the fact that if x is equal to 1, that means that cosine of t is equal to 1, and that means that t has to equal 0. If y is equal to 0, that means negative sine t is equal to 0, and that means that t is equal to 0 and pi. There's only one value that is common to both, and that is t equals 0. So our t value we need is 0, and we take cotangent of 0, which does not exist. In C, we have the point 0, negative 1. So if x is equal to 0, that means cosine t is equal to 0, making t equal to pi over 2 or 3 pi over 2. If y equals negative 1, that means negative sine t equals negative 1, or sine t equals 1 and t equals pi over 2. Again, there is only one value of t common to both, and that's pi over 2. So therefore, we want to take the cotangent of pi over 2, which is 0. Despite the ease of the parametric derivative formula, dy dx equals dy dt over dx dt, this problem is probably better attacked from a rectangular equation point of view. Unfortunately, in many parametric equations, it is very difficult or sometimes impossible to create a rectangular equation. So we need to become familiar with how to deal with this problem from a parametric point of view. We have a formula for dy dx in terms of t. So we can use that rule repeatedly to find higher order derivatives. So we know that dy dx is equal to dy dt over dx dt. Therefore, the second derivative of y with respect to x is the derivative of dy dx, which is the derivative with respect to t of dy dx over dx dt. The third derivative of y with respect to x is the derivative with respect to x of the second derivative of y with respect to x, which is the derivative with respect to t of d squared y over dx squared over dx dt. This seems like a complicated formula, but in reality it isn't. Let's see it in an example that we did previously. In the previous problem, we had the parametric equations x is equal to cosine t, y is equal to the negative sine t, and we were looking at the locations pi over 3 and 0, negative 1. We would like to find the second derivative at those locations. First, the formula. We know that dy dx is equal to dy dt over dx dt, which is negative cosine t over negative sine t, which is cotangent t. So the second derivative is simply the derivative of that answer, cotangent t, over dx dt. The derivative of cotangent is negative cosecant squared t, and dx dt was negative sine t. And since cosecant is 1 over sine squared, our answer is the second derivative is 1 over sine cubed of t. Therefore, the second derivative at t equals pi over 3 is 1 over 
the square root of 3 over 2 cubed, which is 8 over 3 cubed, square root of 3. The second derivative is positive, meaning that the curve is concave up at t equals pi over 3, and that is confirmed by our graph. B asks for the second derivative at the point 0, negative 1. From our previous work, we found that the curve passes through the point 0, negative 1 when t was pi over 2. So the second derivative at t equals pi over 2 is 1 over sine of pi over 2 cubed, which is 1. And therefore, our second derivative is 1. Again, this is confirmed on the graph because at the point 0, negative 1, our curve is also concave up, and therefore the second derivative is positive. So let's put it all together. For the curve given by x equals the square root of t and y equals 1 half quantity t squared minus 2t, we would like to find the slope and the concavity at the point 2, 4. Even though we have been given parametric equations, we will still check out whether we can do the problem from a rectangular equation point of view. After all, we are asked to find the slope and concavity at a point rather than a time. It is easier to solve for t in the x equation. Squaring both sides, we get x squared equals t. So therefore, y is equal to 1 half of x squared squared minus 2x squared, or 1 half quantity x fourth minus 2x squared. We have a relatively simple rectangular equation. So dy dx is equal to 1 half quantity 4x cubed minus 4x, and dy dx at 2, 4 is equal to 1 half times the quantity 32 minus 8, or 12. So we know that our function is increasing at that point. Our second derivative is 1 half quantity 12x squared minus 4. And at the point 2, 4, we get 1 half time quantity 48 minus 4, or 22. So we know that our function is concave up at that point. You might wonder why we will even consider looking at working the problem from a parametric equation point of view. It couldn't have gotten much easier than we just saw working with rectangular equations. However, working with rectangulars will not always be possible because we cannot always easily solve for t in one of the equations, as we will see in the next problem. So let's do the problem parametrically as well. We have a point 2, 4. But to work with the problem from a parametric equation point of view, we need a time. We need to find the value of t when the square root of t is equal to 2. And 1 half quantity t squared minus 2t is equal to 4. The square root of t equals 2 gives t equals 4. And by inspection, plugging in 4 into 1 half quantity t squared minus 2t gives 4 as well. So t equals 4 is our time. dy dx is equal to dy dt over dx dt, which gives us t minus 1 over 1 over 2 square root of t. And we can change that to 2 quantity t to the 3 halves minus t to the 1 half. So finding dy dx at t equals 4 gives 2 quantity 4 to the 3 halves minus 4 to the 1 half, which is 2 quantity 8 minus 2, which is 12. Same answer that we got working rectangularly. Our second derivative will be the derivative of the derivative over dx dt. 
which gives us 2, 3 halves square root of t minus 1 over 2 square root of t over 1 over 2 square root of t. To simplify this complex fraction, we'll multiply by 2 square root of t over 2 square root of t to get 6t minus 2. And therefore, the second derivative at t is equal to 4 is 22. Again, the same as the rectangular answer. As opposed to number 3, where we could choose to work with the rectangular equation or with the parametric equation, Number four gives no such choice. It reads, a cycloid is modeled by the parametric equations x is equal to t minus 2 sine t and y is equal to 2 minus 2 cosine t, where t is greater than or equal to 0. There are four parts of this problem. This is the graph of the cycloid. Its application represents the path of a dot that is painted on the side of a tire as a car is traveling forward. We are first asked to find dy dx. There is no way that we are going to work this problem in a rectangular fashion because solving for t for in either variable is pretty much impossible. So we use the fact that dy dx equals dy dt over dx dt which is equal to 2 sine t over 1 minus 2 cosine t. Next, we are asked to find the equation to the tangent line to the curve at t equals pi over 4. We have some work here. First of all, we have to find the point. And the point will be xy, which will give us, when we plug into the formula, pi over 4 minus the square root of 2, 2 minus the square root of 2. We also have to find dy dx, where t is equal to pi over 4. We plug into our dy dx that we just found and get 2 sine of pi over 4 over 1 minus 2 cosine of pi over 4, or the square root of 2 over 1 minus the square root of 2. So the point slope formula is y minus quantity 2 minus the square root of 2 is equal to the slope, the square root of 2 over 1 minus the square root of 2 times the quantity x minus quantity pi over 4 minus the square root of 2. I choose not to simplify that. C asks the values of t where there are horizontal tangents. Horizontal tangents occur where dy dx is equal to 0. And therefore, we set the numerator of dy dx to sine t equals 0, and we get t is equal to 0, pi, 2 pi, etc. d asks values of t where there are vertical tangents. Vertical tangents occur when dy dx does not exist which means the denominator of dy dx, 1 minus 2 cosine t, is equal to 0, meaning cosine t is equal to 1 half, and therefore we get t equals pi over 3, 5 pi over 3, 7 pi over 3, etc. We confirm all of this graphically. We graph the point when t is equal to pi over 4 and draw the tangent line in red. We show the horizontal tangents in blue, we show four of them, and we show the vertical tangents in purple. There are three of them. Suppose you were asked whether this curve is increasing or decreasing at t is equal to pi over 4. At first glance, your thought might be that the curve starts at the origin and then starts up along the green path and following the orientation arrows. And therefore, it would appear that the curve is increasing. That is not true. When we are asked whether a curve is increasing or decreasing, we're interested in the shape of the curve. At t is equal to pi over 4, the slope of the tangent line is negative. 
which means that the curve is decreasing. So do not fool yourself by looking at the path. We're just interested in the shape. Back in an earlier video, we spent some time calculating the arc length S on rectangular curves. Let's review that procedure. We said that if C represents the graph of y equals h of x on an interval x1, x2, then the arc length S can be written as the definite integral from x1 to x2 of the square root of 1 plus dy dx squared dx. Or the more familiar formula, S is equal to the definite integral from x1 to x2 of the square root of 1 plus h prime of x squared dx. And that only works if h is differentiable in all values between x1 and x2. We are probably more interested in arc length on parametric curves because parametric curves have numerous applications and typically we're interested in how far a particle travels along a parametric curve from two times, t1 to t2. So let's generate that formula. Let's let C represent the graph of the parametric curve x is equal to f of t and y is equal to g of t on t1, t2. By the same formula, we have s is equal to the definite integral between t1 and t2 of the square root of 1 plus dy dt over dx dt squared dx. Now let's do a little creative algebra. We will get this with a common denominator and write that square root as the fraction dx dt squared plus dy dt squared all over dx dt squared. And on the outside, we will multiply by dx dt times dt. In reality, the dt's cancel, and we are left, we have the same expression that we had before, just a dx. We can write the square root of a fraction as the square root of the top over the square root of the bottom. So we have the definite integral between t1 and t2 of the square root of dx dt squared plus dy dt squared all over dx dt. And we will then multiply that by dx dt dt. The dx dt's cancel out. So we're simply left with the integral between t1 and t2 of the square root of dx dt squared plus dy dt square. So the formula that you need to know for arc length of a parametric equation is the integral from t1 to t2 of the square root of f prime of t squared plus g prime of t squared. And that only works if c is continuous and differentiable. In 5a, we are asked to find the arc length of the parametric equations x is equal to t minus t squared and y is equal to 2t to the 3 halves from t equals 0 to t equals 2. So our arc length formula says that s is equal to the integral from 0 to 2 of dx dt, which is 1 minus 2t quantity squared, plus dy dt, which is 3 square root of 2t, quantity squared, dt. And that becomes the integral from 0 to 2 of the square root of 1 minus 4t plus 4t squared plus 9t dt. Finally, we get s is equal to the integral from 0 to 2 of the square root of 4t squared plus 5t plus 1 dt. It is rare that you get expressions here that can be integrated and you use your calculator to get 6.292. In 5b, you're asked to find the arc length of the parametric equation. x is equal to natural log of t, y is equal to e to the t, on the interval t equals 1 to e. 
So our arc length is the integral from 1 to e of the square root of dx dt, which is 1 over t squared, plus dy dt, which is e to the t squared, or 1 over t squared plus e to the 2t, the square root of that expression, dt. And it turns out to be 12.507. When you were in grade school, you learned a lot of basic formulas. Many of them have their basis in calculus. One of them, for instance, is the circumference of a circle. We know that if we have a circle with radius r, we can express the circumference as 2 pi r. Let us see where that formula came from. Let's work in rectangular equations first. We know that a circle with radius r can be generated by the formula x squared plus y squared equals r squared. We first solve for y. y is equal to the square root of r squared minus x squared. Technically it's plus or minus, but when we take the derivative it will get squared and the plus or minus will be plus anyhow. dy dx is therefore negative x over the square root of r squared minus x squared. We will use the x and y symmetry feature of the circle to say that s is equal to 4 integral from 0 to r of the square root of 1 plus x squared over r squared minus x squared. Getting the common denominator, we can write that as 4 integral from 0 to r of the square root of r squared over r squared minus x squared dx. The square root of r squared is r, so we could write this as s is equal to 4r integral from 0 to r of 1 over the square root of r squared minus x squared. And that's a special form you need to identify as an inverse trig. So this becomes 4r inverse sine of x over r evaluated from 0 to r. Finally, this becomes 4r times the quantity inverse sine of 1 minus the inverse sine of 0. And that becomes 4r times pi over 2. And we get 2 pi r as our arc length. Let's show the same result parametrically. A circle with radius r has parametric equations. x is equal to r cosine theta, and y is equal to r sine theta. First step is to write dx d theta as negative r sine theta, and dy d theta as r cosine theta. So our arc length is 4 integral from 0 to pi over 2 of the square root of r squared sine squared theta plus r squared cosine squared theta d theta. Since sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta is equal to 1, we are integrating the square root of r squared times 1, which is r. So s is equal to 4 integral from 0 to pi over 2 of r d theta. And that is 4r theta evaluated from 0 to pi over 2. Remember that the variable of interest here is theta, not r. r is a constant. We just don't know its value. So the integral of r d theta is 4r theta. Finally, this becomes 4r times pi over 2 minus 0, and we end up getting 2 pi r. What is going on here? We have a small circle in orange rolling around the circumference of a larger circle in green. On the smaller circle, we paint a dot in blue. And as the smaller circle rolls around the larger circle, we create an epicycloid, which is traced by the point in blue. A 
A circle of radius 1 rolls around the circumference of a larger circle of radius 5. The epicycloid, traced by a point on the circumference of the smaller circle, is given by the parametric equation x is equal to 5 sine t minus sine 5t, y equals cosine, 5 cosine t minus cosine of 5t, as shown in the figure below. We would like to find the arc length of the epicycloid. We start by taking dx dt and dy dt. dx dt is 5 cosine t minus 5 cosine 5t, while dy dt is negative 5 sine t plus 5 sine 5t. This figure has cusp points when dx dt and y dy dt are simultaneously 0, which occur at t equals 0, pi over 2, pi and 3 pi over 2. The safest thing to do is to just find the arc length in the first quadrant and use the symmetry feature to multiply the result by 4. So s will equal 4 integral from 0 to pi over 2 of quantity 5 cosine t minus 5 cosine 5t quantity squared plus quantity negative 5 sine t plus 5 sine of 5t quantity squared dt. And that turns out to be, using the calculator, 4 times 10, or 40. The fact that you get a precise number tells you that this expression can be integrated by using the fundamental theorem. We will not go through that process. In number eight, we have a bicycle race course that is in the shape of a spiral, whose parametric equations are given by x equals t over pi cosine t and y equals t over pi sine t, where x and y are measured in miles. The race will start at the origin, do three spiral revolutions, and then travel a straight line back to the starting line. We want to know how many miles is the race. This is an arc length problem. So first we find dx dt, which is 1 over pi times the quantity negative t sine t plus cosine t, and dy dt equals 1 over pi quantity t cosine t plus sine t. One revolution would have t running from 0 to 2 pi, so three revolutions has t running from 0 to 6 pi. So our arc length is s is the definite integral from 0 to 6 pi of the square root of 1 over pi squared times the quantity t squared sine squared t minus 2t sine t cosine t plus cosine squared t plus 1 over pi squared times the quantity t squared cosine squared t plus 2t sine t cosine t plus sine squared t. We can factor out a 1 over pi squared under the radical sign and therefore it comes outside the radical and our s is equal to 1 over pi integral from 0 to 6 pi of the square root of t squared sine squared t plus t squared cosine squared t plus cosine squared t plus sine squared t dt. And utilizing the fact that sine squared t plus cosine squared t is equal to 1, we get 1 over pi integral from 0 to 6 pi of the square root of t squared plus 1 dt. We cannot calculate that by integrating, so we'll use the calculator and get 57.206. That takes care of the spiral. We now have the straight line distance back to the start of the race. When t equals 6 pi, x is equal to 6 pi over pi times 1, or 6. So we have 6 miles back to the starting point and the total race distance is 63.206 miles. Finally, a topic 
not covered in the AP exam, but mentioned here. If a smooth curve C given by the parametric equations, x is equal to f of t and y is equal to g of t, where t is between a and b, and C does not intersect itself, then the area of the lateral surface of revolution about the coordinate axes is given by one of two formulas. If we're rotating about the x-axis, then g of t must be greater than or equal to zero. Then sa is equal to 2 pi integral between a and b of g of t times the square root of dx dt squared plus dy dt squared dt. If we're rotating about the y-axis, then f of t must be greater than or equal to 0, and sa is equal to 2 pi integral between a and b of f of t times the square root of dx dt squared plus dy dt squared dt. So in example 9, we have a wedge of an orange is formed by rotating the parametric curves x is equal to 4 cosine t, y is equal to 4 sine t, where t is between 0 and pi over 3 about the x-axis. We'd like to find the total surface area of the orange. This problem was chosen because it's one of the few where the integration can actually per be performed. So the surface area is equal to 2 pi integral from 0 to pi over 3 of the g function, which is 4 sine t, times the square root of the sum of the derivatives squared. So we have negative 4 sine t squared plus 4 cosine t squared dt. This gives 8 pi integral from 0 to pi over 3 of sine t times the square root of 16 sine squared t plus cosine squared t dt. But sine squared t plus cosine squared t is equal to 1, and we're left with the square root of 16, which is 4. So we have 32 pi, the integral from 0 to pi over 3, of sine t dt. And that becomes negative 32 pi times cosine t evaluated between 0 and pi over 3. And that becomes negative 32 pi times the quantity 1 half minus 1, or 16 pi. Since we want the total surface area of the orange and not just the lateral surface area, we need to include the circular area of the orange. We know that at t equals pi over 3, the radius is 4 square root of 3 over 2. So the area is pi times 4 square root of 3 over 2 squared, which is 12 pi. Adding to the 16 pi for the lateral surface area, the total area of our orange is 28 pi.